At Team Toyota, they've been selling and servicing new and used Toyotas in your community for over 50 years. And you can reserve your next new Toyota with them today. You'll get a realistic timeline, and even in this crazy market, they won't charge you over MSRP. Or don't wait at all. With over 75 certified Toyotas, including a bunch of RAV4 and Highlanders, you can drive one home today. And you can always trust them to maintain your current vehicle. Their service and collision centers are high-tech, comfortable, and will save you time and money. Team Toyota can help you go anywhere you want, but they'll always be your hometown team. Just visit TeamToyota.net and choose from three locations in Langhorne, Glen Mills, or Princeton. Hey everybody, welcome to the Phillies Talk Podcast presented by Team Toyota. Thanks for listening or watching on YouTube or digesting however you are. Uh, This is probably going to be the last solo podcast for a little while. We'll have some news for you on the new format moving forward here in a couple of days. But just wanted to kind of get back here and talk about all the injuries that are taking place both with the Phillies and throughout the NL East because they're going to have some ramifications, particularly early in the season. The latest news out of Phillies camp uh, injury related dealt with Ranger Suarez, who had a setback. He's dealing with this forearm elbow issue that the Phillies are not overly concerned about. They don't sound overly concerned about it, but it doesn't look like Suarez is going to be ready for opening day or able to make his first turn through the Phillies rotation. He now hasn't pitched since March 8th. It's March 23rd. As I sit down to record this, We're talking about more than two weeks where he hasn't been able to kind of ramp up toward a start. And had everything gone according to plan, if he didn't have a setback, this most recent setback, Suarez would have been in position to make his first start, albeit in a shorter stint. It would have been, you know, two and two thirds, three innings, something like that, just because he's not built up. But now with Suarez looking like he's going to be out at least the first start of his of his season, uh, the next options for the Phillies are either left-hander Michael Plasmeyer, who's allowed one run in 11 innings this spring, or the alternative option, which it looks like they might be going with, which is left-handed reliever Matt Strom stretching out to multiple innings. The Phillies want Strom to be able to cover at least three innings by the time they leave camp. Now, that's not ordinary for a reliever, but Strom's not an ordinary reliever. This is a guy who made 16 starts with the Padres in 2019. Uh, He has a diverse mix of pitches, five different pitches, four-seam fastball, two-seamer, slider, curveball, and changeup. And quite frankly, it might be an even deeper repertoire than that based on the different ways he can manipulate some of those pitches. Strom's last two outings uh, this spring, he, he had gone two innings and two and a third innings. So he is stretching out. And the first time that the fifth spot comes up in the Phillies rotation, it looks like it could be Matt Strom going, you know, two or three innings, followed by a cast of relievers such as Andrew Bellotti and Connor Brogdon. And, uh, you know, then the Phillies, if they're leading when they get to the backstage of the game, all those late inning relievers they have, like a Kimbrel Soto, uh, Dominguez Alvarado. But you know, that's an interesting option that's kind of presented itself just because of Strom's versatility. Uh, when the Phillies signed him early in the offseason to a two-year, $15 million contract, they weren't doing so uh, with this idea in their mind. But the rotation is not going to look the way the Phillies would have hoped out of spring training. Suarez is down. Andrew Painter, who was battling for that fifth spot in the rotation, uh, he also won't pick up a baseball because of an elbow sprain. He won't pick up a ball until at least the first few days of April. So like a best case scenario would have seen the Phillies emerging from camp with Nola, Wheeler, Taiwan Walker, Ranger Suarez, Andrew Painter making up their five-man rotation, and then Bailey Falter as the next man up. And that could have meant that Falter began the year at AAA starting games, or he could have began the year as the long reliever in the Phillies bullpen. But because of all that's gone on in this month of March, Falter is now the number four starter to start the year. And that fifth spot will be either Strom followed by relievers or Michael Plasmeyer, the lefty. Now, something that could play into that decision, at least for the first turn through the rotation, is that it comes up against the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. And the Yankees are a predominantly right-handed lineup. The only impactful left-handed bat in their lineup is Anthony Rizzo. The top six spots in the batting order for the Yankees, five of them are right-handed hitters. I mean, you're talking about guys like Judge and Donaldson and LeMayhew and Claver Torres. The majority of their... uh, their th- their power threats are right-handed hitters. So, you know, potentially the Phillies look at that and say, eh, I don't know if this is the best assignment for a finesse lefty like Michael Plasmeyer. So something to keep in mind there. 
But kind of roaming around the NL East, this isn't unique to the Phillies, these these big injuries popping up. I mean, the Mets are obviously dealing with the sudden loss of Edwin Diaz, which is as impactful as anything they went out and did this offseason. Uh, the Mets spent five years, $102 million over five years. It was the richest contract ever awarded to a closer. That's what they gave Diaz this offseason. And it was worth it. I mean, he is coming off of an astonishing season. ERA just above one. Uh, I think it was like 118 strikeouts and 18 walks and 62 innings, something absurd. Uh, and there's really no replacing him. Beyond Diaz, the Mets have David Robertson, the former Philly, who looks like the next man up. And he's experienced pitching a lot of big games, but he has his stuff is nowhere close to Edwin Diaz's. And then with Robertson likely shifting into the closers role, it means that your setup men become probably Adam Ottavino and Drew Smith. So it's a potentially shaky situation in that Mets bullpen. And if you're looking at ways, things that can derail a championship caliber season with huge expectations, this is one of them. Shaky bullpen is one of them. I, you don't, I don't need to tell Phillies fans that after all the experience in 2019 and 2020, and really the situation wasn't rectified until last season with the Phillies. Uh, the Mets are dealing with the Diaz injury. They're dealing with Jose Quintana's injury, this strange rib injury that is look, it looks like it's going to keep him out until July at least. So the Mets signed Quintana uh, to a two-year deal to be their number five starter, and he's not going to be ready for at least half the season. Uh, they also uh, are dealing with a, a potential day-to-day uh, -day situation for Brandon Nimmo, who jammed his knee sliding into second base over the weekend. Nimmo thinks he'll be ready for the start of the season, but just one other thing to monitor. It's interesting when you start looking at these projection systems and the sports books that the Braves are still viewed as the heavy favorite to win the NL East, to, to win the NL East for the sixth straight year, uh, way past the Mets in terms of the over-under win total projection or uh, their odds to win the division. I think the Braves were, an e at points bet as of this recording, the Braves were plus 100, an even bet, whereas the Mets were plus 170, and the Phillies were plus 350. So you know, I'm not sure that there's quite the disparity between the Phillies and the Mets that some of these projection systems have, especially when you start to like include the injuries or the, the different ways that, you know, the different ways that one of these teams could, um, you know, rise or fall uh, that Mets bullpen. It's going to be a big topic all year. And I would think that Steve Cohen and that front office is going to be aggressive in trying to, you know, solve things quickly. They might not wait until the trade deadline to add a big piece in their bullpen if they're able to do so. But the Braves, the heavy favorite to win the division for the sixth straight year, they chased down the Mets during the second half last year. Both teams finished 101 and 61, uh, but the Braves had the head to head tiebreaker, having won more games against them. So they won the division, and the Mets were right out of there in the wild card round. Uh, the the Braves, I mean, there's a lot to like. Ronald Acuna Jr., you're expecting a full season out of him, and this may fly under the radar a bit, especially outside the NL East, but since Acuna debuted at the beginning of 2018, you know there's only one season where he's played at least 120 games? So he's been in and out of the lineup a lot for the Braves over the last few years. Uh, this is an opportunity for him to play a full season, and he's, you know, quite frankly, one of the best players in all of baseball. The Braves are also hoping to get substantially more this season out of Ozzy Albies. This, the, their dynamic uh, second baseman who hits for power and can can run a lot as well. Uh, he was limited to just 64 games last season. Broke his foot in June, came back in September, broke his pinky a day later. So he didn't provide much for the Braves last season. Started out the year hot from a power perspective, but it was a disappointing year for him individually. And remember, he's just a year, Albies is just a year removed from 40 doubles, 30 homers, 100 RBIs, and 20 stolen bases. Uh, he did take a, a, an interesting step back last season on the base pads, even before the injury. Like his sprint speed was way lower than it had been in recent years. So, you know, it's worth monitoring, like, has he lost some of his speed? But, you know, Acuna, Albies, Austin Riley, the Braves went and added Sean Murphy, one of the best two-way catchers in all of baseball from the athletics made a trade with the A's and then extended Murphy pretty much immediately, six years, $73 million. That's two years in a row that the Braves went and acquired a player from Oakland who is just entering his prime and signed him to a long-term deal. It was Matt Olson last year, and he had a very good season, and now uh, Sean Murphy this year. And then Michael Harris II, who is you know, going to be one of the most exciting players in baseball for a long time, it looks like. The Rookie of the Year last season, 
is already one of the best defensive center fielders in all of baseball. He can run. He hits for average. He hits for power. The Braves spent most of the, he spent most of the year at the bottom of the Braves lineup last season, but you may see him at the top or in the middle this year. That's just how good he is already. I think the big question with the Braves, well, as I sit down to record this, actually, the news just came out. This is from David O'Brien at the Atlanta Journal, or rather the, from the Athletic, covering the Braves, that uh, – that Rizel Iglesias, the Braves closer, is also going to start the season on the injured list. So Edwin Diaz is out for the season. Rizel Iglesias, not anywhere near as serious, it looks like, but he's going to be on the IL to start the season with what the Braves are calling a low-grade shoulder injury. Keep in mind, the Braves did lose Kenley Jansen, their closer, last season to the Red Sox. So that Iglesias loss early in the year, that could loom pretty large. But what I was going to say in terms of the biggest question for the Braves is how – Spencer Strider and Kyle Wright are able to follow up those awesome seasons they put together in 2022. Strider was the Rookie of the Year runner-up. I actually voted for him for Rookie of the Year. Uh, he struck out 202 batters, 202 in 131 and two-thirds innings. Just an insane rookie season. He was successful out of the bullpen to begin the year and then was lights out as a starter. And when you start to look at pitchers around baseball who should be affected by things like the shift change, the fact that teams can no longer overshift and put three infielders on one side of second base, in my personal opinion, I think Strider should be less affected by that change than just about anybody in baseball because of how many bats he misses and how heavy a fly ball pitcher he is. So like the ground balls might not affect him as much. I think you're going to see some pitchers whose ERAs rise significantly. I don't know that he'll be one of them. Kyle Wright uh, went 21 and five last season with a 3.16 ERA, led the majors in wins, was very consistent, although he struggled a bit toward the end of the year. And you just wonder, are are, the, are both of those guys going to be able to follow it up in these sophomore seasons? They both pitched about 40 innings more than their previous career highs. Will that catch up to them? Uh, will the larger book the league has on both Strider and Wright affect their performance? As I said, I think Strider is in a better position to replicate his 2022 production that is right, but we'll see. And then, you know, the other starting pitcher for the Braves, who's an important piece is Charlie Morton, who's pushing 40 years old, uh, was not that good last year. 31 starts, only nine of those 31 starts were quality starts. He had a 4-3-4 ERA, which was a full run higher than his 3-3-4 ERA in 2021. So, you know, which Morton shows up this year? Is it the guy who's been a number two, number three starter over the last handful of years? Or is it the back-end five-and-dive pitcher that he was in 2022? At the bottom of the division, you know, the Marlins and Nationals are still bringing up the rear. The Marlins did add. Uh, they added Luis Arise from the Twins, who won the batting title last year in the American League when he hit 316. He's a 314 career hitter, uh, as I wrote it the other day. At NBC Sports Philadelphia, just you know, previewing the NL East this season, I see a rise as like an even more pesky version of Jeff McNeil, an even more annoying version of Jeff McNeil. The guy never swings and misses. Uh, he sprays the ball around. He hits lefties. He hits righties. He hits a lot of line drives. So Luis Arise, I think, is going to be an annoying <laughs> player for, for the NL East teams to face in the middle of the Marlins order. The Marlins needed to, to trade pitching for offense. They traded Pablo Lopez to the Twins in that deal uh, to bring back Luis Arise. They also signed Gene Segura. So Gene Segura is going to be somewhere in that lineup, whether it's like the two hole or whether he's batting closer to the bottom. Uh, but, you know, the Phillies won't see as much of Segura and the Marlins as they would have in recent years because, you know, the balanced schedule where every team plays each other now moving forward means that division mates only face each other 13 times as opposed to 19 times. So you go from facing uh, your division teams, what is that? 76 games to facing them 52 games. That's a lot of games against the Marlins and Nationals. The Phillies won't have the advantage of in 2023. And, you know, the Nationals, who lost 107 games last year, look like they could be even worse this season. They didn't add at all. And this wasn't this this offseason wasn't about adding for them. They're in a rebuild. They're very clearly in the early stages of a rebuild. Um this year for the Nationals is about, you know, how do they develop Mackenzie Gore and Josiah Gray in the rotation? How do they develop C.J. Abrams at shortstop and Kbert Ruiz behind the plate? Uh, they're not concerned about their win total. They would just as easily take a high draft pick, you know, the top draft pick rather than, you know, win five more games than expected. But uh, that is one bad Nationals team. And, you know, I think you look at the Phillies, Braves, and Mets, they could have gone 16-3 and against the Nationals if they had that 19-game 
uh, season series against them, but it'll just be the 13 games. And, you know, to that point, you look at the Phillies early season schedule. It's just jarring how few division games there are. Uh, the Phillies, you know, they open in Texas and they go to Yankee Stadium. And after those first two road series of the season, they come home to Citizens Bank Park. And there is an early season division series against the Marlins. The Phillies have the Marlins in April in that uh, fourth series of the season. They have the Reds in their first home series, followed by the Marlins. But then once the Phillies get past the Marlins on April 12th, they don't have another division series until May 25th. So we're talking about just one NL East series for the Phillies between opening day and Memorial Day. Then when they get to you know, Memorial Day, they have a, a, you know, a big NL East road trip, four games in Atlanta, three in New York, three in Washington. But to that point, you know, it's not going to be a lot of head to head matchups. So when the Phillies, you know, first face the Braves and Mets in late May, they could look totally different than they look to start the season. By that point, Rizal Iglesias could be back. By that point, perhaps the Mets bullpen is more settled than uh, we're discussing right now. But you know, a lot of a lot of balls in the air right now as the 2023 season nears. Uh, these teams don't look quite the way they expected. Uh, you know, the other big thing with the Braves is that Dansby Swanson, they didn't re-sign him. They didn't make much of an effort to re-sign him. He signed with the Cubs. The, the Braves just looked like they weren't interested in that price tag. They thought that Vaughn Grissom was going to replace him at shortstop, who was, you know, so good replacing Ozzy Albies last season at second base. But Grissom... Uh, did not win the job in spring training, and nor did Braden Shoemake, the former first-round pick of the Braves, who was also in contention for that shortstop's job. Instead, it's going to go to veteran Orlando Arcia, who has a much lower ceiling. The Braves feel better about his defensive ability. Clearly, they're prioritizing you know, defensive competence, at least early in the season. But when you talk about how these teams don't look quite the way they projected coming out of camp, that's another, that's another factor. So thanks a lot for listening to the Phillies Talk podcast. Just wanted to come in and check in. Uh, kind of roll around the NL East and talk about the biggest storylines and key injuries ahead of opening day. And don't worry, we will be back here on the Phillies Talk podcast multiple times a week and be back soon with more news on the fills and everything else. So thanks for listening. Talk soon.